welcome back to The Union Show. Tonight we begin a very important series on the state of the Australian economy and the global forces that are impacting on it. We're going to talk to some key union officials and hear what they have to say. Of course, they don't sing the same tune as those conservative economists, and that's a good thing. 1975 saw the... Um failure of uh, American and, uh, and Australian intervention in Vietnam. Preceding 1975 had been four and a half decades of struggle by the Vietnamese people for their independence and in turn they represented a whole uh, series of struggles globally for independence by colonial peoples. So we saw in, uh, in 49 we saw China fall, we saw England get out of India, we saw the Philippines to at least some of its independence uh, issues resolved. We saw a whole range of the, the, the colonial countries involved in struggle. We saw up through the 60s uh, Indonesia. We saw Sukarno come to power, uh, Suharto supported by America in the overthrow and the crushing of the, the Indonesian Communist Party, approximately a million, some say up to 2.5 million killed in the mid-60s. So capitalism was indeed on the back foot. It was being thrown out of the one-time colonial countries. In the mid-70s, Vietnam falls to the Vietnamese people and we saw then capitalism get back to what arguably was its main game, that is globalisation. In, in the mid-70s, we saw a similar adaptation. We saw capitalism realising that it had to, rather than control through the bullet and the bayonet, uh, although that was always the subtext, uh, and, and remains today the subtext, they had, to, uh, they had to control via the market. So they had to put in place debt regimes that would drive national governments um, out of poverty towards producing to the needs of the global market. Um, so ostensibly and on paper, these countries were independent, but of course, in terms of the debts that they would never repay, they'd never even repay the interest on the debts, they were still colonial countries. So globalisation, in order to do that, began a very, very rapid shift of the manufacturing jobs out of what were used to be the first world countries towards the developing countries. We don't call them third world anymore, we call them developing countries. And, 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 and indeed, we therefore saw globalisation representing third worldization of the global market where you can see now in, in countries like America, uh, third, second and first world components of the population. The whole gamut, I suppose, is all about just what they've started over the last you know, 25 years in Australia, you know, the neoliberal policy, you know, with privatising you know, public utilities and you know, public things that were owned by the Commonwealth of Australia and deregulating the labour market, bringing in free trade agreements, you know, which all they're doing is actually selling out the sovereignty and what they're doing, Australian government's doing, is making workers absolutely vulnerable to you know, overseas capital. We had import and we protected our industry, industries you know, through having a range of things, including tariffs, and we used to have government policies for industries too. You know, we used to have long-term plans of where the industries would be. Now none of those exist. You know, now they can't think past making a quick buck, you know, which is the next free trade agreement they, they can make, which limits their amount to ever put on tariffs again. You know. Um, that limits um, legislation and that stops overseas company, companies from you know coming in here. So the USA Australia Free, Australia Free Trade Agreement restricted the uh, Foreign Investment Review Board, and the Foreign Investment Review Board only stopped a handful of things, but it made recommendations to thousands of companies that wanted to come to Australia that they had to have so much local content or so many directors who were locally. Now that's sort of been done away with. It used to apply, I think, up to $50 million. Now it was up to $800 million before the Foreign Investment Review Board could even even look at it and see if it was in Australia's interest or not. Countries around the globe know that you need a strong manufacturing base to underpin your strong economy. That's why there's proactive policies there. So we don't know what they're doing domestically, but internationally, in the boardrooms around the, country, you know, around the globe, no doubt in Detroit, mm. you know, they're sitting and looking at this. In Europe, no doubt they are, because they have to. There's regulations in that mm. have to comply with it. So certainly, you know, you know, we've got to convince the people in the boardrooms around the globe that the cars that they'll be making in the future, it's worthy of making them here. And so we need to lay the groundwork for that, about providing incentive, the infrastructure, and the skills to do that. 
you know, when companies make a decision they want to set up or make an investment here, the first thing they want to look at is, well, if they've got the people to work, have they got the skills to do it? Mm. What's the growth? Have they got potential to grow in regards to technology, research and development and innovation? So they're sort of the, the combination of things which is an overall incentive about trying to maintain, you know, manufacturing in this country. You look at the island experience, they made a decision you know, 20 years ago. First thing they decided was, well, we're going to invest in skills. So it was more universities, more training, more high-end. Um, they then looked at specialising in certain areas. Pharmaceutical area was, was a high area. And uh, they built up this entire industry. They've built up their manufacturing industry. They're exporting around, around the world because they picked those key ingredients. There are vulnerabilities in the global economy. If you start with the topic of the day, how on the one hand do you have uh, the kind of downturn, the crisis that was started by the US subprime market, mm -hmm. and indeed at the same time inflationary pressures uh, in uh, the US, in Europe, in Australia, in most of the world in fact. Just last week come out with a set of transparency criteria regarding sovereign wealth funds. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a good start, but it was the US and the UK governments who blocked the ambitions led by Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, to see greater transparency in private equity and hedge fund operations. Mm -hmm. So right now you have large sectors of the capital markets not regulated or not regulated to the extent that they should be by way of transparency. Mm -hmm. More broadly in terms of uh, where you get global capital and how you make sure that it's uh, uh, stable and it's transparent and it's actually being used for uh, for good purpose and not for uh, simply that increasing greedy profit take, mm. then we would want to see greater transparency.